Good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to the South Bank. I'll say a few more welcomes in a second, but just to introduce myself, my name is John Preston. I'm the chair of the LPFA, and I am delighted to welcome you here today. Can I just deal with a few housekeeping points uh, to start with? Uh, as you'll see on the slide, there are no fire alarms planned for today, um, so if in the unfortunate event that the fire alarm rings, then that is real, and please make your way um, uh, sensibly through the uh, exits as shown. Uh, I would ask if you could please put your phones on airplane mode uh, to prevent any interruptions during the session today. Um, the Wi-Fi is open. If you go to SC free, um, it is open and doesn't require a password, so please do join in there, and particularly if you'd like to register and ask us uh, online questions. Um, we have um, guests in our foyer today. We have two groups out there. The first is representatives from LPPA, our administration um, body. Um, so um, if anybody has any questions about their personal pension, please do feel to, free to uh, join them there. They're actually under the pension point um, uh, banner. Um, pension point is our online tool, which uh, we'll refer to later on. Uh, but please do feel free to ask them if you have any personal questions. Uh, and uh, I will introduce the speakers in due course. Uh, but just to let you know who they are, we have Robert Brenner, our Chief Executive of LPFA. We have Joe Derbyshire, who is the Managing Director of LPPA. We have Richard Tomlinson, who is the Chief Investment Officer of our investment arm, LPPI. Uh, and we have Paul Hewitt, who is LPFA's Responsible Investment Officer. Uh, and I'll just talk you through what each of them are going to say in a minute. But now that my housekeeping duties are over, I would like to say how delighted I am to see so many of you here at the South Bank Centre. And I'm delighted to welcome the many hundreds of you that are actually joining online today. We are really very fortunate that so many of you show such an interest in the work that we do and the progress that we're making. So thank you um, for attending. And I really do hope that you find this a valuable and informative day. I'd also like to extend a special thank you to those of you who took the time to respond to our survey, our member survey, earlier this year. We ask for your views every two years, and what you tell us really helps to improve the service that we and our partners provide to you. It's very important, both to me and to our board, that our fund is well run and that you receive a professional and efficient service. With that in mind, in the first session, Robert Branner, our Chief Executive, will take you through the progress that we've made this year, and he'll also be summarising what we're doing following your survey feedback. I took over as Chair of the LPFA in January of 2020, and this is the third time that I've stood in this building speaking to you all. On each occasion, the world has been facing major challenges, from COVID to inflation to Ukraine. Today, tensions in the Middle East are high, and we face political uncertainty with elections ahead in the United Kingdom and the United States. Whilst we can't predict the future, it is obviously sensible that we prepare for more storms ahead. And with that in mind, Richard Tomlinson, the Chief Investment Officer of LPPI, is here to tell you about our performance over the last year, and we'll try to set out some of the investment challenges that we might face. But whilst uncertainty is always with us, the key message that I would like you please to take away from today is that the fund is in a strong position and that your pension with us is safe. We're in good financial health. We were valued at £7.66 billion on the 31st of March 2023, which was our last financial year end. And while this is only a small increase compared to previous years, it is positive, especially as it's taken place in a challenging economic and investment environment. It's also worth remembering that at our last formal valuation of 31st of March 2022, we were 128% funded. That means that we have more than enough money in the fund to pay all the pensions that we need for as long as we need to. And our latest estimate as indicates that our strong position has not materially changed. I'm also pleased to say that we've made over £18 million worth in savings on asset manager fees this year compared to our costs before we pool their assets into LPPI. This is both a testament to the benefits of pooling and to the professionalism of our asset manager LPPI. 
In fact, pooling has been a great success story for us. Pooling took place in 2016 and, among other things, encourages funds like us to share asset managers with other funds. We're in a pool with Lancashire and Berkshire, and LPPI manages all of our assets together. This has resulted in strong investment returns over the longer term and a very cost-effective structure. Indeed, since pooling, LPPI has saved over £153 million in asset manager fees. That's more money in the fund to pay your pensions. Now, while paying pensions is our main priority, we also make hard work hard to make sure that we're a well-run and efficient fund, and it's important that you have a good customer experience. LPPA is our administrator and plays a pivotal role here, and if you call our help desk with a query, it'll be, you'll be speaking to one of our colleagues at LPPA. But I will be very frank here and say that LPPA have had a very challenging year. We know from our survey that some of our members have not been given the service that they have a right to expect. And whilst there are clear signs of improvement, there is more to do. I'd like to thank, therefore, Joe Derbyshire, the Managing Director of LPPA, for travelling down from Preston to be with us here today. And she'll give you some insights into the challenges that they're facing and what steps are being taken to improve the service. Let me turn to responsible investment. Most of you will know that we're taking action on climate change, and I'm pleased to say that in the coming months, we'll be publishing the progress that we've made in reducing our carbon emissions. And whilst I can't give you the details quite yet, I can say that we've made really good progress against our targets and are heading in the, in the right direction. If you are interested in this area, I'd encourage you to visit our website's Net Zero Hub, where we'll soon publish details about our progress. In our survey, you were positive about the action that we're taking on climate change and the environment. However, you also told us that you wanted to hear about the work we do to improve the lives of others and also improve the behaviours of the businesses in which we invest. With that in mind, Paul Hewitt, our Responsible Investment Manager, will talk to you later about our new Responsible Investment Policy and Strategy, and I'm sure you'll be pleased to hear about what we have planned. I'm quite sure that many of you have questions that you'd like to ask, and we do have a Q&A panel session uh, at the end of the day today. Now, alternatively, please do speak to one of our team uh, in the foyer today, or you can email our communications team after the event, and we'll try and deal with your queries then. But can I please just emphasize, if you have any specific questions about your personal pension or position, I'm afraid we won't be able to deal with that in the main forum today, but we do have the LPPA desk outside in the foyer under the Pension Point banner, and please do feel free to go and talk to them about any individual issues you've got. There's also um, a separate um, desk with tax aid, or tax help for older people. They're a charity which um, provides assistance to people who need um, help with their tax affairs um, on a free of charge basis. So please do feel free if you have a particular tax query in relation to your pension to go and see to tax aid. Thank you for your time in attending today. Let me now pass over to Robert. Good morning, colleagues, and uh, a warm welcome from me too for your um, member forum today. So, the quote I've got on screen um, is from somebody called Max Verstappen, who some of you might know. He's a very famous racing driver. In fact, he's world champion last year and this year. And you'll see the quote reads, you can improve on everything. You are never perfect. And I use this quote not just because the team made me, because we have some racing fans in the team, but also because it's a really good indicator for where we are. Some of my brief messages today are about the progress we've made, but also that we continue to try to evolve and improve on behalf of you, our members. So I'm going to talk about three areas. I'm going to talk about um, the pension, your pension. I'm going to talk about how we're doing, some of those improvements. And also, as John's already referenced, I'm going to talk about feedback from the member survey, which you contributed to and we'll be taking some action upon. So about your pension. Um, 
As you know, the only reason we are here is to um, pay your pensions. That's what we do. That's what we um, are charged with doing. Um, that's our primary pur purpose. Um, and to do that, we have to generate income from the investments uh, we make. And we also manage the risks to the fund and getting sufficient returns um, on those investments. We're also committed to how we operate the fund on your behalf uh, and how we operate is, is demonstrated through a variety of different means, formally and informally, and of course today. Um, so if you do have questions on the running of the fund, please add those to the Q&A at the end. We're also very big on collaborating. We like collaborating with other people, other funds, um, but ideally in the context of delivering savings for you, our members. Um, John's already meant referenced um, Joe coming down from Preston to talk about the admin business um, and I think uh, there may be some questions on admin later but it has been a difficult year um, so my apologies to anybody in the room who's also had some difficulties with the admin service this year. So you know we have over a hundred employers in our fund and on the screen you'll see a number of um, examples or a number of logos for those organisations. We have primary schools, we have academies, we've got further education bodies. Um, we have housing associations, so you might recognize or indeed be from some of the organizations on the screen. But the snapshot is really saying we have a very diverse um, group of employers that we support um, throughout the fund. So how are we run? What are we trying to do? We're trying to be a well-run and transparent pension fund. John mentioned pooling and the fact that the investment business is our investment pool. There are eight of these throughout the UK, that the, throughout England and Wales, sorry, that the government um, mandated a number of years ago in LPPI. Our, ours and LPPA is the admin business um, based in Preston. The pools take responsibility for day-to-day -day investment, so the board of LPFA will set the strategy for the investment, for the investments, and LPPI um, deliver and make the, t the decisions about how to deliver those um, investment returns. Ourselves as officers of the fund, the local pensions board and the LPFA board make sure that the organisation runs smoothly and we oversee the work of LPPA and LPPI. Um, we also have a local pensions board which is a statutory organisation which is also in place to help and assist the main board in the operation of the fund and oversight of those duties. Um, and you'll be familiar from previous um, fund forums or annual reports that we have taken a fair amount of work back in-house, uh, which used to be outsourced to LPP. Um, and I'll touch a little bit later on some of those areas that we're dealing with um, in-house in, in rather than outsourced. So some numbers for you. Um, the 96769 is the number of members in the fund. This was at 31st of March. Um, it's actually gone up slightly, so we're getting close to 99,000 uh, members that we look after now. Um, about 23, 24,000 active members, and then 35,000 pensioners, and about 30,000 deferred members. So it's not quite one third, one third, and a third, but it's of a similar, similar sort of note. Um, the 7.66 looks a little strange on there because it hasn't got the, the word billion after it. <laughs> this is quite good fun when you come to the slide deck and go, oh, did someone put this together for me? Okay, 7.66 pence, no it's not. 7.66 billion. Um, now that's an interesting number because it's pretty much the same as last year's number in extremely challenging um, economic conditions. So returns have held up but it has been a challenging year, so it's quite good um, that we're still around that level. Um, John also mentioned that funding-wise, so they might we have to pay, and they might we have to pay, there's still a sizable gap of nearly a billion pounds, so there is some headroom in the fund. Uh, the 122 is the number of employers I talked about in the slide you saw earlier about um, the types of employers we have, and 20 is the number of staff that we have within the team. So, every year, so this is my fifth member fund forum, every year I big up the annual report and accounts and I'm disappointed this year that I haven't been handed an annual report and accounts to share with you and urge you to read it. 
there's some pictures on the front. I know the second half is very dry. It's got lots and lots of numbers in it. It's got the accounts in it. It's quite dry. The first half is really, really interesting. Really, 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 really interesting. Tells you a lot of stuff of what we do. Tells you why we do some stuff. Talks about strategy. It talks about delivery. So I would urge you again, go, go on the website and have a look at the annual report and just flick through some of the things we do. And that will give you much, much more detail. So... Other areas about what we're doing and how we're doing, talking explicitly about paying pensions. So um, we have some of these numbers. The second one is, is an interesting one. So we, it's very, very simplistically, we get money in from employers and from members. So we get about 105 million from those 122 employers every year. We get about 50 million from members every year. And then we give that money to Richard I'm not looking up now in case he's smiling or grimacing. But we give that money to Richard, and Richard makes us some more money on that 150, 155 million. And that amount of money, the 155 plus Richard's contribution, still not looking at him in case he's grimacing or smiling, that then we use to pay pensions. We pay out approximately £20 million pounds a month. So we pay out about 240 million. So there is a little bit of a gap in terms of money's in and investment returns and money's out. And that's not untypical in the local government pension system. But that's basically how the financing works. We're going to talk a little bit later um, about um, responsible investment. Um, but Responsible investment is sitting alongside the overall objectives we have to make a return on that £155 million. So we need to generate income, return, whatever you want to call it, so that we can continue paying pensions into the future. 128% funded, so that's 128% 20 more than we need if it was being paid or everything was being paid out today at the 31st of March in 22. This year... So about a year's, a year's movement on, year and a half movement on, that's come down a little bit to 118% funded. And what that means is we've got 18% more than we would need if we had to pay out everybody today. And that's a combination of factors like inflation, it's a combination of factors like returns aren't quite as high as they were, but it should still give you some reassurance that the fund is extremely well funded. Responsible investment, um, say Paul will have a session um, later on taking you through some progress on this. Responsible investment is a mixture of things to us, but essentially it boils down to risk. It's just another way of managing risk within the fund. Um, we believe that everything has got some connectivity, so um, we're trying to protect our assets from environmental, social and governance issues. Um, and we want to make sure that we continue to have the ability to pay your pensions. Um, climate change um, is also explicitly one of our policies alongside, we've recently refreshed a responsible investment policy. So we have a, trin, a twin track approach to explicit climate change and net zero activities that we're trying to do as a fund. We're targeting for 2050 to be net zero and major progress by 2030. And responsible investment um, policy, which looks at more um, social governance and some other environmental like natural capital type things as well. So we have a twin track approach to doing, doing that. If you do look at the website, the LPFA website as well, you'll see there's quite a significant um, content about net zero and responsible investment. And you can drill down and see quite a lot of information about what we're doing and why we're doing it. So being a well-run and transparent fund is what we, what we set out to do. Um, we do use, we do try and put a lot more stuff on the website and certainly social media, website, events like this, um, putting papers on the website, trying to share more information is something you asked for two or three years ago. So it'll be interesting um, to, to get any feedback later on as to how that's landing uh, and if that's the kind of thing you want. We also respond to FOIs, press comments, and we do a fair amount of public speaking um, at pension events or local government events largely on the subjects of good governance and responsible investment. That's the kind of areas we do. So, 
Let's talk a little bit more about um, the uh, collaboration piece of the objectives I talked about earlier. Um, we do work with other organisations, so we work with a lot of climate change um, organisations that you'll recognise. Uh, we also um, work with other funds, so with some other funds we're part of GLIL, we're part of the London Fund, which you can see more details on the website about. Um, we do some investments directly into London and we do a lot of UK-wide investments and we do like to collaborate with other people. One of the examples of that sharing that I talked about earlier um, is on the back of the first survey uh, we did, you asked for more information about the investments we hold, particularly the kind of stocks and shares we hold. So Tumalo, as you'll see on the screen, had put together for us um, a, a, a list of all the holdings we have so you can see uh, which stocks and shares we, we hold. Um, and that gets a lot of hits uh, on the website. So again, if you're interested in what we as your fund invest in, that's a good way to look at um, what we're doing and the companies we, we're investing in. We're also working with the good economy, so some of you might have come across, uh, to bring some more transparency to, to the fund and to the reporting we do for you. Uh, and when this project is complete, you'll also see um, a lot more information, not just on stocks and shares, but in um, ports, buildings, wind farms or solar farms that we invest in the UK. So we're trying to provide more information on those areas of investments we hold. Um, and ideally, in a year or so's time, we'll probably have coverage for those details on who we hold uh, of about 70% of the fund. So that's the ambition to get that information out there to you. So the other thing that came out from the survey, uh, the member survey, the recent one, um, was we asked you to contribute some thoughts about how you felt we were doing or just what LPFA meant to you. So you'll see an awful lot of words on here, which is just a, um, a word map, a word cloud of the feedback you got. And there's a real um, mixture of different um, comments um, and words that you think. So we talked about responsible, we talked about um, dependable, we talked about um, safe pensions and excellent working. But there are some things in there about um, puzzle, slow, cautious, you know. So it's, it's interesting for us to try and take that. And certainly when people, when members have given us some real detail on, there's a free format bit of the survey, so you're able to expand on some of these things. The team can then go away and think, well, how do we more, be more transparent? Or how do we react to some of these words you put on there? But this is a, a representation of, the major words, or the majority of words, which came across um, in the survey. So, on the back of those comments and uh, the, the survey results, uh, we're going to do um, a number of things. Sorry, excuse me. We're going to do a number of things um, going forward. Um, so, we are looking at uh, more. You've also asked about hard copy mailings. So more communication. Uh, we're trying to do more communication digitally and via the website, but we're conscious that people still want um, post or written correspondence, so we'll be doing some more of that. Um, we're doing uh, more transparency around climate change and responsible investing. Uh, we're doing more public speaking and engagement with colleagues and other funds um, in the industry. Um, so we are responding to some of those areas um, that you put into the member survey. So just going back to the quote at the very beginning, um, we are striving to do things more efficiently, more transparently. We are asking for input from you and trying to respond to those in a positive way and share with you how we're doing. Um, we are looking to improve our communications uh, with employers and with members on a more regular basis. Um, and I think we are um, striving to deliver value for money and good service where we can when we interact with you as our members. So thank you very much for listening.
Good morning, everyone. I'm Richard Tomlinson. I'm the Chief Investment Officer at LPPI. And ultimately, I have the, the uh, privilege, as I say, and stress, of running the portfolio and overseeing the portfolio with our, our team at LPPI. So I'm going to talk to you briefly this morning uh, around the portfolio, talk a little bit around the performance, how the portfolio is invested, and so, some high-level thoughts on the outlook of looking backwards, what's taken place this year, and a few thoughts uh, and perspectives on what might be to come uh, in the next, say, 12 to 18 months. So who are LPPI? Uh, many, I'm sure many of you have, have been, this isn't your first uh, in, uh, member forum, so you may have seen me speak before, but I'll just recap for those of you that are uh, either newer here or may not quite recall who we are. Uh, LPPI, we are the investment management group within local pensions partnerships, so my, uh, my colleague Joe uh, leads the investment administration side, and I, I sit on the investment. I, I lead the investment management group within LPPI, and our, uh, sit on our leadership group. So, what do we do? What do we deliver? So, we provide two key services to our stakeholders, our clients, including the LPFA. One is to manage investment management. So that means the day-to-day -day management of portfolios. That means agreeing a mandate with objectives and constraints with the, the, uh, the stakeholders, the client. And then managing the portfolio to do what we can to meet those objectives as best we can uh, within the parameters or the risk envelope that we're given or risk, risk guidelines. And that portfolio, as I'll come to uh, slightly later in the talk, uh, I'll talk through some of the detail of how that is invested. The other key element of our activity is investment advisory. So we provide advice to our clients and stakeholders on how to think about the elements that are what's the right word, in their camp or in their tent to think about whether that's the framing of some policies and how for them to think about what instructions to give us. So we bring a degree of, a, I'd say, significant capabilities and expertise to help our clients navigate some of the more complex and thorny issues, uh, but ultimately when the decision is theirs. Um, in, in terms of core aims for what we do, I'd always say that our, the principal job is to pay all pensions as they fall due. That's, the, that's kind of easy to say, actually quite hard to deliver. And then within that, there are all kinds of uh, goals, sub-objectives. So that means growing the capital that's given to us from the contributions. That means investing in line in terms of sustain sustainability and responsibly managing risks, maintaining portfolio liquidity so we have cash available to make payments either out to stakeholders or to, to, to members, and to manage the portfolio itself. But ultimately, our core aim revolve around that and that is our purpose uh, and we work very closely with our our stakeholders and the officers within the LPFA. So thinking, looking back on the, the last year, what, what have we seen? This, it's been a fairly interesting year or two to say the least, in fact I could probably say the last five years. If you start thinking about some of the events that have popped up in the last few years, in just Covid and some of the other and certainly you know, war in Europe and other things. There's a whole range of uh, elements I could, I could go down the rabbit hole on. I won't at this juncture, um, but, you know, it's been quite volatile, I think, it's, as, as an, an understatement. And we ha I think we are seeing a, a, a change in perspective. That's not to say that it's different this time, because those people will always laugh at the <laughs> famous last words of any investor, and it's always, you always, uh, it's slightly foolish to say that, but it does feel like the world has changed a little bit from where we stand today compared to where we might have been a few years ago. Uh, the key drivers in, in the recent past, as I'm sure you're all aware, one, inflation. And that, that has hit in multiple ways, both as, you know, in terms of ever, all of us living our lives, whether that's paying for food or um, other things that where inflation comes through, energy bills and the like. Ultimately, though, that, and that has been a major issue both, as I say, for, for, uh, at, the, at the individual level, but it then feeds through into, mark, into financial markets and portfolios because markets are forward-looking in terms of how, they fit, how, mar how markets uh, expect. It's a discounting mechanism, essentially. So there are expectations built in then in terms of what inflation might be in the future. And there are, as I said, there are multiple layers. That's a, it's quite a complex conversation. However, the key point is that inflation is hitting... First of all, the payments out of the fund, so how much is paid to, to you, the, me the, the members, which in, in the one sense from your perspective, it is positive that your benefits are inflation linked. However, from, from thinking about the portfolio, it means that there's an increasing need for cash 
and to pay out those benefits. It also means that as, those, as inflation comes through, realised inflation, the future benefits that the scheme needs to pay and we need to provide capital for in the future go up. So we need to be forecasting and thinking about how that plays through. The second point is the impact on interest rates. I'm sure everyone's aware that interest rates have moved uh, significantly in the UK and globally, but let's just think about the UK to begin with, uh, in the last few years, let's just say, going from essentially zero to circa 5% globally. That's a, that has a significant impact on all kinds of things. Uh, for people, if people have got mortgages, that may, can make a significant difference. Um, it may, potentially, for, for maybe for this audience more, you, get some, you actually get some interest on your savings if they're held in cash, which I suspect is beneficial. Uh, but it also impacts the investment markets. It impacts the perception of how forward-looking returns might be. And again, there's, there's all kinds of elements in, at play there, but fundamentally, I think the big change to think about is that for a considerable period, probably since 2008, uh, capital wasn't, I'm not going to say it was free, but interest rates were very low. And that led to a, a mindset and a set of behaviours that were then, uh, that came through in, portfo in portfolios and, uh, act, say, economic activity. That paradigm does seem to have changed a little bit. I'm not saying that interest rates are going to stay at these levels forever, but it does feel like we're, going to be, we're in for a period where interest rates are likely to be higher for a while than they have been in, in the last, say, decade on average. So it does, it ha that has led us to some changes in, uh, the portf in portfolios, in the way markets are behaving, in the valuations of certain assets. Uh, so it's a, it's a really important theme, and it's something that we, you know, this is my day job, I, I live and breathe this stuff not quite 24-7, but close to that. And this is, you know, say, so it, these, these, these themes are very, uh, very prominent in what we do every day. But I think the key point to communicate is that changes in the world that we're seeing, these aren't, um, you, you, you don't always know when, but you do think that these things can happen. And part of our philosophy of managing portfolios that we've had since the inception of LPPI is not to try and think about the world in terms of one future outcome, to say the world will be like this or like that. It's about understanding that there are, uh, there's uncertainty and the world can, can take different paths. And then it's trying to build a portfolio that is robust to a significant number of different outcomes. And that underpins so much of our activity is to keep think, challenging ourselves. So how do we build portfolios for our clients that can survive and prosper in as many future alternative versions of the world, where that's higher inflation, lower inflation, higher interest rates, lower interest rates, more geopolitical uh, instability, less stability, sorry, I'm not the right word, more or less stability, and other variants. And the, and the way we achieve that is by building a portfolio that has a exposure to a broad range of assets, is diversified um, gl globally or internationally, subject to, uh, let's say, risk constraints and prudent constraints based on factors such as whether it's the geopolitics, the economics, the RI and other things, or ESG I should say. Um, but the, the, the key being we, we try and build portfolios that have broad exposures that can be stable and resilient in a whole different range of outcomes for the world. So when things do change, that the portfolio, we aim for it to be as stable as possible to ensure we can maintain our primary aim, which is to pay all pensions as they fall due. And as, as we've noted on the slide here, uh, this is coming through again, the results of the 2022 actuarial valuation and showing the fund continues to be in a strong and healthy position. So segueing on to fund value, this gives you a snapshot. Robert mentioned the numbers earlier, uh, the 7.7 7. 7 billion at the March 2023. And as an investment manager, that's the sort of chart you always want to see. You, 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 you always want to see a chart that goes bottom left to top right, because that generally shows you're going in the right direction. At times, you don't always have that, but it's always very nice when you have one that you can draw a little line doing that and showing that over time, uh, you're delivering performance and compounding of capital, and things are going in the right direction. Um, as you can see, the fund has grown materially in the last, um, what's that, since, since 2016. So just dropping a little bit more into the investment strategy uh, of the fund, the, uh, I'll very quickly just pick off some of these uh, big buckets. because so This shows you the very broad asset allocation of the fund. 
50, around half the fund is in global equity. So that means listed stocks and shares. So think uh, Vodafone or Glaxo. or so, these, are, these are names you may be familiar with, Marks and Spencer. Listed, generally, very large companies, uh, and it's on a, on a global basis. So it gives that diversity that we're looking for and stability. Private equity means owning the uh, equity. So the same, it's still equity like the global equity, but it's in privately owned businesses, not listed businesses. These businesses tend to be smaller uh, and, yeah, and they're privately owned. Real estate means fairly obvious, as I'm sure you can expect, property. Within the real estate portfolio, it is skewed to commercial property. Uh, and within that, it, it, we, we, are, we do, we're quite targeted in what we look at. So, for example, I'm sure it's no surprise that you know, some office exposures are struggling now. As the world has returned to the office, in inverted commas, since uh, post-COVID, but there is less demand for office space, certainly in places like London. And you're seeing a real, I think the right word, bifurcation in, in uh, that property. So we're in offices uh, between the, the prime stuff, or prime uh, units that are aligned with essentially a net zero future and those which are second or third tier, which are going to be very expensive to retrofit and, uh, and tenants don't want them. So there's, there's certainly some differentiation there. Within real estate, uh, and we will focus on things like industrial units and other things. But the point I'll make on real estate is we, there is a degree of residential exposure in there, which I'm sure for those of you that have attended this forum over the years will have seen uh, the examples of, of these uh, assets that are in that portfolio, uh, say built to rent, providing uh, housing that is, is, is desperately needed around, around the UK. Credit essentially means lending uh, and that's within within that portfolio there are loans to a whole range of borrowers and different types of assets whether it's property corporate um, and various other activities infrastructure means the assets the, the assets that essentially underpin our societies so we think wind farms think um, toll roads this sort of activity power generation that type of thing and we've got a material portfolio the significant chunk of that is uh, implemented through what is called GELO which is a partnership we have with other LGPS schemes but within GELO we are the principal um, manager and overseer of those assets the, the, the bulk of the activity sits within L PPI, although we, we are say so we are partnered with other LGPS funds. And then cash and fixed income is a smaller part of the portfolio. Essentially, that's, you know, it's like your, in, in, as, as an individual, it's the, think of it like your current account. It's the cash you have on float that's available that we use to, to transfer to the scheme to pay your pensions. And it's the liquidity that we hold um, for managing you know, say the portfolio as well. So in terms of investment performance, uh, the, the Five-year investment performance is very strong. Uh, at the moment, it's annualising at 8%. And um, we have, what the, the, and that's the dark blue, I think, what do you call that, navy chart or bar. The green is what we would call the policy portfolio. So that is, um, I'm trying to think the right way, it's, it's, it's a market-based benchmark, predominantly, that we compare ourselves against. So over five years, the portfolio is 1.1% 1, 1 .1 annualised um, every year ahead of that benchmark. The three- and one-year performance is... Uh, slight, slightly you know, in line, slightly behind. However, it's the five-year and longer is the key, the key focus for us. And at the moment, things are still looking very positive or looking very positive. So bringing us back now to an outlook, um, I've covered a number of these points already. The, you know, the challenges on in interest rates maintain and, and, are, and persist. I think I touched on earlier the importance of inflation, how that feeds through to your benefit payments. What I'd say to you is we're very aware of the uh, inflation dynamics globally. We, we invest in line with that and try and build a portfolio that is that participates in inflation. So, i.e., we look to have a proportion of the portfolio invested in assets that perform better in inflationary times than less inflationary times, if, if that makes sense. So, it's to provide some pass-through for those uh, for, through inflation. Uh, and, and specifically UK inflation, I'd add as well. Uh, interest rates, I think I covered this earlier. I think we're expecting a period of higher interest rates than we've seen for the, for the recent past. In some ways, again, it's a, it's a much longer conversation that we can talk about another time, but uh, higher interest rates and what we're seeing forward, it's not all bad. There are benefits as an investor to see that. It, it, does, it changes the dynamics, but it's not necessarily bad. Um, 
uh, you know, we, we, I, th I think it would say there's, you know, short term there are some challenges, so lower, lower, lower returns in the near term. But in the medium term, I, I'm, I say I'm, I'm reasonably optimistic. I'm not painting a pessimistic picture here in the medium term, but there are some short term challenges specifically uh, as the Bank of England seeks to get inflation under control through you know, rate rises. Um, we, we know responsible investment in net zero. I know Paul's going to talk about that in some more detail later on today, and that Paul will, 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 will give you far more detail on that. Uh, but, um, yeah, we're a long term investor, as are the LPFA. The key perspective from, our, from us as the portfolio management team is to make sure, as I say, I repeat, we can pay all pensions they fall due. We, are custod we view our role as custodians of our clients' capital and reputations, and we invest with a long-term perspective to grow the capital from those contributions to make sure we can pay those pensions in the future. And I now have a red flashing light, so I will step down and stop talking. Good morning, everyone. I'm Joe Derbyshire. I'm the Managing Director of LPPA. And I'm going to talk to you about, about six main things today. So our role as the administrator of the fund, um, where our performance has been and why and what we're doing about that. Um, I'm going to talk about pension increases because they, in this high inflation environment, have been significantly higher than they were. Um, talk about the member experience, member communications, and I'm going to finish with some thoughts on cyber security. So for those of you that have been here before, we'll probably be familiar with this, but what we do as LPPA is we provide pensions administration through every phase of your, your journey through the administration um, process from joining the scheme when you are a, a new joiner to getting your information pack through to all the kind of things that can happen in your pension journey right through to the end in terms of paying pensions and ultimately paying death benefits. Um, we run a, a help desk, um, so have about 30 people on our help desk um, that you can call um, and speak to and they also deal with any online inquiries that you might have via our website. Um, we also work closely with the LPFA team around member engagement and comms, so I'll touch on some of that later, but things you will have seen like newsletters and so on. We have an online portal, which I'm going to talk to you more about as well, which is where you can access documents, run estimates, um, lots of things like that, change the nominations for death benefits, things like that. And obviously we work with all those employers that Robert referenced earlier, and I'm going to touch on how critical that relationship is to what we do as well. So this slide gives you our operational performance and pretty graph, lots of numbers, what does it actually mean? So each bar there represents the months from April 2022 to March 2023. And this is measuring the casework that we do. And to give you an example of a type, the type of casework that we do, it may be something like we have five days to send out a retirement quote from receipt of all information. So if we perform that task within those five days, then that's a pass. If we don't perform that task within five days, it's a fail. And what that graph shows you with the bars is how we've done overall against every case that we measure for the last year. And you can see that it's a bit up and down. The red line on the graph are what, where we target to be. Um, and you'll notice that there's kind of, it starts the year a bit lower and then there's a bump kind of further on in the year. And that, that those, those kind of lower targets are where we relax the targets for some short periods of time, two, two periods of three months, um, to support the migration to our new administration system. So we had a, a, lower, a lower target there. Um, the last month on there is May 23, um, sorry, March 23, um, and that's at nearly 90%. The story since then is, is a good one. It's been progressing up. It's been at sort of 95% overall since about... May, June time, the, the cases that are really important to you and, and to us are the, the payment cases, that's our job, um, and it's taken them a little longer to catch up um, after moving systems, but we are, we are there now in terms of hitting that 95% for retirements and bereavement cases as well. Um, these 
The next slide is the figures for the help desk. And again, you can see the impact of kind of moving administration systems. So what this is showing you is each bar is the total number of calls into our help desk. So not just for LPFA, but for all the schemes that we administer um, and what happened to that over the year. And again, you can see these kind of peaks and troughs. Um, and again, you know, leading on from March 23, where have we got to from May 23 onwards, the average wait time for the help desk has been under our target of four minutes generally. Um, and for the last two months in particular, it's been about two and a half minutes. So, you know, I'm conscious that through this period of change, there have been some times when it's been difficult to get through to our help desk. Um, and that shouldn't be the case now. Um, so, you know, if you do, if you do still have problems, then please, you know, let my team know. Um, but certainly, the average wait times show that people generally are getting through it and that service has improved. Um, you know, why why is it why we've we been through these challenges? We so during 2022 we migrated all our all our um, members over to a new administration system. Um, we replaced a number of disparate systems that didn't communicate very well and didn't talk to each other very well. Um, it's not something that an administrator would do lightly. It is the most disruptive thing that you can do as an administrator. And we had to do it for reasons I won't, I won't go into today in a very aggressive time scale. Um, and it's taking, I think we thought it would be bumpy. It's probably been more bumpy than we thought. We thought it would take some time to come out the other side. It's taken a little bit more longer than we thought it would to come out the other side. Um, but I think we are where we were before we started this now. And now we push on to really improve the service because we have the foundations to do that. Um, so you will, you know, I, I would echo again what John said at the start is, you know, there's, a, there's an apology from me for any of you that have um, been subject to some of the kind of the disruption to service that we faced through the year. But I would hope that you're starting to see signs of recovery. And as, as I say, we really push on from here. So what we've we been doing to push on, um, we've been focusing on two main areas in particular where the service has been, has fallen. So that's retirements and complaints. And on retirements, we're looking at the process end to end. So as well as us having a new administration system, the way that the employers, those hundreds of employers that, that have been referred to communicate with us is via our systems as well. So we've had to get used to a new system. So have our employers. Um, so what we know is that it's taking them longer to notify us sometimes of retirements and, and some of the quality that we're getting is not necessarily where it was. So we're working together with those employers to improve that going forwards. We also know that if any of you have an AVC, um, the process for retirement takes longer. If you have an AVC, substantially longer. Um, so what can we do, again, working with the LPFA team and the AVC providers to speed that process up and make that a bit more streamlined? So we're really deconstructing that retirement process and looking at how we improve it. And some of that will involve automation. So um, as we continue to embed this system and turn on some of the kind of bells and whistles, then we'll start to see more automation and things happening more quickly. We have had some people challenges, as you always get through a period of change. And I think we're, we, as any other employer, are reacting to the post-COVID world or you know, post-pandemic lockdown world where people are making decisions about where and how they work and the employers they want to work for. Um, and change isn't for everyone, and it's been large-scale change at LPPA. Um, so we've got quite a lot of new people. We're doing lots of technical and customer services training and rolling that out. And we have been recently recruiting some, admin, some experienced pensions administrators as well so that we can, we can add some experience to the teams. That, that's not easy in the current climate. Some of you may be aware there is a huge demand for pensions administrators, partly driven by a very busy regulatory change agenda. Um, so it's a difficult market to recruit from, but we, we are having some success there. We've also launched um, what we call our efficiency and service improvement program. And there's kind of two aspects to that. One is tactical, i.e. fix the bugs and the things that you always get when you put in a new system. Um, the other one is far more strategic in terms of increased automation and those kinds of things. So we've just started on our automation journey. The first process that we have automated is refund quotes. Um, but we'll start to see that spill into other, other areas as well. Um, pension increases. So this is something that, because inflation has been high, pension increases have been substantial. 
So just to clarify, um, I think this is a fantastic example of why your LGPS pension is so valuable and brilliant. So LGPS pensions are aligned with the consumer price index. And for those, um, it, essentially while you're still working, it's revalued in line with that index on the 6th of April every year. For those of you that have retired, you get the full increase if you've been retired for 12 months. Um, if you've retired partway through the year, it's prorated over the year in terms of that, that increase. And of course, in April last this year, the pension increase was 10.1%, um, the largest increase in the past 10 years, which goes some way to, to help with those cost of living challenges that we're all facing. Um, the increase is based on on CPI as of September, so we do know that next year's increase will be 6.7%. Um, there are reasons, there are other reasons as to why you might not get the full 10.1%, so if you've not had a full year's worth of retirement, that's one reason. The other reason is that some of you may have what's called a guaranteed minimum pension, and we like to complicate and use jargon in the pensions world, but essentially some of you may remember that employers and members had the chance to opt out of the old state earnings related pension scheme. So that guaranteed minimum pension part can, make, can, can cause a few complexities as well. So these things are not easy to explain, um, but there is help on our website um, and some good, good things on there that explain things. If, um, so do go there and, and have a read. Member experience um, on the help desk. Um, this, these are actually LPFA specific figures. Um, and what you can see there is, again, we've got the, the bars. The green are the people that say they're satisfied, the, the kind of whites are the sort of neutral and the reds are the people that say they're dissatisfied. Um, the volumes are fairly low, so it can be a bit volatile, but I, th I think what you can see there is that, that actually, you know, we've got some way, some way to go in the help desk, but considering some of the wait times, um, it, you know, we, we are it's starting to improve. You, you'll see a better trend if we, if we extended it further to the right. Um, so. We've still got work to do there. We're also going to be changing the questions that we ask. So um, what happens at the minute is if you call into our help desk, you'll get put through to, at the end, you get an option to stay on the phone and, and ask a survey. Um, at the minute, it's very heavily influenced by how long somebody waits and things like that. So we're going to structure the questions slightly differently going forward. And then this is the same picture for retirements. And again, you would expect it to have been impacted by the length of time that people have taken to get their pensions um, due to the systems disruption and other things. Um, the numbers are very small there, so I don't, you probably can't see the numbers at the top, but the numbers in there are quite low. We do about 300 retirements-ish a month for LPFA. Um, we don't get that many respondents to the survey, so again, if you've been in through the retirement process, you'll get, you'll get a questionnaire at the end. Now, um, please do fill it in. Um, feedback is really useful, and we do use that feedback. We take comments and we take other things back into our processes to, to improve things. Member communications, we, we, have, we will be doing more of now that we're through the systems migration piece. You will see things on our website like videos in terms of explaining how to register for our online portal like Pension Point. Um, newsletters, we send, we, we send out electronically but you can also get printed copies. I think it's worth saying that if you you will generally get digital communication from us unless you have opted out of ecoms and you have the choice to do that whenever you like and then you would get a paper newsletter for example um, we do lots of um, employee training as well um, around some of the employers so these for people who are still working planning ahead for retirement and things like that again how to access your online portal um, and we've we've recently kind of started some member research panels so if any of you are interested in joining those to give us some kind of feedback and help improve things going forward um, then please do talk to the LPPA guys outside or myself and we'll, we can get you in touch with somebody who can put you onto one of our member research panels. We do provide you with statutory communications these are the ones that we are we have to do by law so we will do things like send you an annual benefit statement um, and your P60 if you're in receipt of a pension. We, we think very carefully about how we communicate. So generally it's digital preferred. It's certainly not digital exclusive because we are aware that not everybody is technically savvy and there are reasons why people may not want to interact online. Um, that can be just in terms of their technical capability or, um, and it can be 
Now, we shouldn't forget in this, in, you know, in this times of cost of living that there is also a kind of digital poverty. You know, not everybody has access to the internet. Not everybody wants to have access to the internet. Um, so paper copies of things will be around for some time to come yet. Um, the website, we, we, do, we, we re regularly change it. One of the big changes that you may have seen recently if you've been on is that the contact us section of the website has a drop down box that you select what your query type is that you're trying to get in touch with us on. And when you select that, it will, it will then automatically point you in the right direction of where you might be able to get that answer on our website without having to send an email. And what we found is that people are finding that extremely useful and that's actually reduced the number of emails that we get via that kind of route into us by a third. Um, so it's really, because these websites are big and there's lots of complex things, it's how do you actually find what you want to find when you're there and that, that, that's certainly having those prompts in there and guiding people to the right place has been helpful. Um, and we're looking to increase the registrations on Pension Point um, so that this is our online portal where you can go in and find your documents, run estimates, those kinds of things. Um, and raising aware, awareness of that whole self-service piece is important and a key part of our strategy, and I'll explain why. Um, so I've touched on a couple of things there. So hopefully that most of you will have got an, an online newsletter um, our paper newsletter that was that we had we published in August 2023. Um, we also sent out emails, and just in terms of you know, what off the back of those newsletters, what do people read about? What are people interested in about? These were the top five kind of articles on the website. So pension increases is is, is the main one. Um, and again, I think that you have a brilliant pension with great pension increases. Um, it's Bear in mind, it doesn't have the triple lock, which your state pension does. So there will be a difference. Um, understanding your annual benefit statement. Um, they are, as I say, complex documents. We'll be looking to change the way in the future we, we, we structure them and try and make them easier to read, lots more plain English instead of pensions jargon. Um, but at the minute, there's certainly explainers as to how to understand that document. How to prepare for your retirement what happens to your pension in the event of death and again how to register with pension point and i know i keep talking about pension point but it is really important so why is pension point so important um it helps you keep your details up to date um which is great means we can communicate with with you um you can nominate your pension benefit beneficiaries it's more, it sounds like a small thing but really important um you know so if you've not logged on there for a while, do log on, make sure that the people that you've nominated are the right ones, and that's up to date. You can run your own estimates um, for retirement if you've not got there already, and you can access those documents. So we currently have about 28,000 LPFA members registered. That's about 30% of the LPFA membership, so um, there's still kind of some way to go. to get. It's not far away from where it used to be kind of before we moved systems, but we've still got a few thousand to get there. Um, it, it can be easy and straightforward. I appreciate that not for everybody it isn't necessarily. So again, there's some self-help guides on the website or you can call the help desk again and they'll, they'll kind of talk you through it. We will be enhancing Pension Point. Um, we've only just put this new system in really. We're now going to kind of build on it and evolve it. Um, so things we have done in the last few months is we've added service history to, to it for anybody that looks at their service records um, and pension transfers if you've ever had a pension transfer that will appear on there now um, transferring uh, we're going to be looking at more WYSI tools so how much is your pension worth um, different ways to contact us through that secure online portal rather than sending emails and then the really exciting stuff around things like track my case and retire online which with the really kind of WYSI things that allow you to do things very quickly and I'm going to finish with some thoughts on cybersecurity. So this is the kind of stuff that keeps me awake at night. Um, somebody once said, a webinar I was on was, that even the Pentagon gets hacked. And I, and I think we can do everything that we can to prevent it. You can never say never. Um, cyber attacks are on the rise. Um, we are 100% focused on it. We have Cyber Essentials Plus accreditation and we have ISO 27001 accreditation. We also invest quite heavily internally around training our people. So the vast majority of 
cyber attacks that you will have seen in the press recently, there was, there's been Capita, there's been kind of Move It, there's been other ones, uh, come from phishing emails. So they emails sent to people and they click on a link and that allows, that opens the door. So we are quite vigilant around that. We have a lot of online training for our staff and we also, we see, the, we see things every now and again, we'll put emails in there in training and see if they click on it. Now at the minute, it's a little bit blunt in that it goes to everybody at the same time and you can sense the buzz around the office when somebody, somebody goes, oh, it's that email that we're, you know, they want us to click on and, and the, the chatter starts to go around the office. So we're actually going to be using one of the first pieces of AI technology that's actually going to send things to people more randomly so that they, they'll be at different times and things like that so that they won't be able to kind of talk to one another and say, don't click on that email that's doing the rounds and we'll get a much better test of whether or not people are doing that or not. Some tips for you on how to avoid pension scams. You know, if you're not expecting a call, a text, or an email from someone, no, then be very, very careful. We will only send you important documents. Ideally, we'll put them in the portal, so that, that's where you can access them. But we will only ever send doc important documents by email or through a secure messaging portal. Um, if anyone contacts you with a view to things like tax savings on your pensions or transferring your pensions for some kind of magical pot of gold. You know, be very, very careful. You know, very rarely do we ever get something for nothing in this life. And there are high pressure kind of sales companies out there who will be contacting you about um, transferring your pensions and things like that. Again, just, just really, really take care and seek financial advice on anything like that. And if you're concerned about any scams, report them to the pensions regulator and the Financial Conduct Authority. They, they get more and more sophisticated. Um, so just be very, very vigilant. Um, and, on, and on that note, scaring you to death, I will say it's time for a coffee break and we will restart at 12.25. Thank you, everyone.
Welcome back, everybody. Well, welcome back. Uh, thank you for coming back from tea uh, so promptly. Um, we're going to move on. If I can, if I can just call us all, please, back to order. Thank you. Um, moving on to the next stage uh, of uh, our session this morning, uh, I'm going to hand over to Paul Hewitt, uh, LPFA's Responsible Investment Manager, to talk about our efforts in respons uh, investing responsibly. Paul. Thank you, John. Um, this is my first fund member forum. I started LPFA just a little bit over a year ago, two weeks after the previous one. Um, so, um, normally at this juncture, I might try and say something funny to break the ice, but last time I tried to do that, my eight-year-old daughter, Demelza, looked at me and rolled her eyes and said, Daddy, you're not very good at telling jokes. So, there we go. So, today, I'm going to talk to you about the work that we're doing to um, uh, have developed a new RI policy and take you through the process that we've gone through um, in doing that. I'm going to be introducing our new RI key issues and objectives. Also giving you some intel into how our member survey fed into that process. And also a little bit about how we work with LPPI in delivering on that policy. So firstly, in terms of developing our policy, why do we do this in the first place? Well, the Local Government Pension Scheme regulations require us to have an RI policy through the investment strategy statement that uh, we publish. And so the starting point for doing that is, first of all, to establish what are our beliefs when we look at, when we consider responsible investment. How and why is responsible investment important to us? And then from articulating those beliefs, we then go on to identify what are those issues that are most important for us and why are they important and relevant. So, first of all, looking at our RI beliefs, we have seven of them. And this is these next two slides are, I promise you, the only two slides where we've got really small text, but I will talk through them. So the first belief around materiality, this is a, um, a belief that environmental, social and governance issues are materially relevant to the investment decision-making process that our managers undertake on our behalf. When we're looking at moving the dial in terms of risk and opportunity on those environmental, social and governance issues. We also believe that collaborating, not just with LPPI, but with the wider investment landscape is 
most often the best way to get better results in what we're looking to achieve. Transparency is something that you'll be familiar with already in terms of our positioning as an organization. It's also important to hardwire that into our RI stance too, that in terms of the companies and the investments that we're invested in, transparency is important to us as an investor, as a stakeholder. Also, the investment process um, is important in terms of transparency too. We heard earlier on about how the world is changing and how that impacts us as a pension fund. And that's no less true of environmental, social and governance issues. They are tremendously dynamic. So we also have a belief around the fact that we need to be flexible in terms of understanding and re-evaluating which issues are important to us at any given point in time and how we react to them. We also believe in the importance of acting as responsible owners and using our ownership powers to um, pursue our priorities as well. Linked back to the transparency piece, robust governance, um, good governance of assets and good governance of the investment process um, is vitally important to um, a well-run pension fund. And finally, divestment, uh, which is um, always uh, quite a popular term to come up. So in terms of our beliefs, we do reserve the right to divest if, as, and where it really is the best route to take for us but we always see that in the wider context of evaluating risk and opportunity. So moving on from our beliefs into identifying, identifying our priorities, I mentioned earlier on about collaborating with LPPI. Um, the process of finding out what our RI priorities are likely to be really was a very collaborative process with our colleagues at LPPI. So we looked through basically four things. Firstly, what issues are we most heavily exposed to in our portfolio? And then looking at the wider world, what are the key issues around us today? And what can we find out about what perhaps those things are going to be tomorrow? I've already mentioned the aspect of what our members think was a key um, <clears throat> input as well. And also, what are the things that LPPI are already doing for us on our behalf? Apologies. So when we talk about the key issues, we first and foremost are looking at categorizing them and looking at them through a particular lens. So Robert mentioned earlier on about our climate change policy. That is a standalone policy. And as you can see here, it's the first of our four RI pillars here. <clears throat> and it has that word systemic in there because climate change is a systemic issue which affects all asset types and all sectors. But sitting alongside that is also the question of natural capital or perhaps biodiversity is another way of looking at that topic. And that has the potential to provide one third of the necessary solutions and to further build systemic resilience to adverse climate impacts. So we can see that it's very closely linked to climate change. And one of the aspects of this slide is to underline to you the interconnectivity between many of these issues. Social and just transition is about understanding the changes that we need to go through as an economy and as a society, and for us to play our role as investors in supporting that. And lastly, we've already spoken about good governance. Um, that is also one of the key pillars through which we examine the key issues. So what are those key themes? We have six of them. We have renewable energy and distribution. So 
most obviously that's around um, involvement in renewable energy generation, things like wind farms and solar farms that we know we are invested in. But it's also about encouraging the wider economy to adapt and change to using renewable energy in their own processes. We have pollution and the circular economy. This is really the key theme that plays most strongly to that natural capital pillar. It's picking up on the relationship between biodiversity and the activities of the companies and the investments that we're involved in. But as we'll see later on, it also relates quite directly to issues of clean air, clean water and the environment as well. Moving on to the social pillar, we also have fair pay. So this is about promoting better practice of pay for workers and also management across our investments. So it's about paying people fairly. It's also about providing appropriate incentive structures, um, not least in light of the responsible business practices that we encourage our companies to employ. The importance of diversity, equality and inclusion is, uh, is significant because breadth of input and perspective is more likely to result in more robust and balanced decisions when it comes to those business decisions that companies were invested in are taking. So it is an important issue for us as an investor in those businesses. Accountability and oversight, I've touched on really already. Um, that relates to our investments being forthcoming in providing the information that we expect and need to act upon as investors. But also it relates to the investment management process and us as your pension fund in order for us to be accountable to you. And we know that that is something that is important to you, our members. The final of the six themes is responsible tech. What a great moment for the speaker to go. Yes. Um, there we are, we're back. I promise you I didn't, I didn't organize that, but what a brilliant moment that was. Um, obviously we are living in a digital age now. And we heard from um, uh, Joe's presentation earlier on about the, relation, about the steps that uh, we have to take to protect ourselves. Um, and so that's also a set of considerations that companies we're invested in needs to take because we as investors in those companies are exposed to those risks too. Equally, as we are looking to deploy particularly um, renewable energy solutions across a wide range of sectors and businesses, there are technology developments that are available to us to benefit from. So they are the six key themes. Just a little bit about the member survey and how that contributed towards um, us identifying those six issues. So the member survey, um, we had over 3,000 responses to um, having sent it out to the 41,000 or so members that we have email addresses for and permission to use. Um, so that was a response rate of around about 7.75%. And there were a lot of things that it told us, but summarising that into four key takeaways, two-thirds of the respondents said that they can identify RI and cite it as a reason that they stay as members, which is really positive. We asked some questions around financial return or positive impact, and around about half of the respondents felt that positive sustainability impact was perhaps more important to them than maximising financial returns, which was an interesting um, conclusion, but perhaps more, um, perhaps more uh, significant was the dynamic of avoiding doing harm, which three respondents out of four said they had a, a preference for. And on that theme of divest or engage, we got a very strong signal from our members that's in alignment with our own position that engagement is a more constructive approach prior um, rather than straight divestment, um, which just one in eight of our members expressed a preference for. So looking at the key themes, um, we 
asked members to provide their responses to lists of environmental risks and opportunity themes, and the same in relation to social themes, and again the same in relation to governance issues. And um, the results that we got back align quite nicely with the RI policy uh, priorities that we've identified. So in the, in the field of climate change, 57% chose climate change, energy efficiency, and the move to renewable energy as top three environmental concerns. And that's reflected in the RI policy, including energy solutions, uh, renewable energy solutions and distribution, as well as, of course, our separate climate change policy. Two thirds responded um, in relation to clean air, water and soil on, in terms of natural capital, which I referenced earlier on when talking about the pollution and circular economy. In terms of social and just transition, nearly three in five chose living wage and worker pay, and over 40% chose gender pay gap and board diversity as corporate governance concerns, and all of those um, considerations are reflected in the um, key themes that we have. And in terms of good governance, the strongest signal we got of all these issues was bribery and corruption. 64% of you um, chose bribery and corruption as the key governance concern, which of course feeds very directly into that theme of accountability and oversight. So thank you to all of you who responded to that member survey. It was very, very informative for us. And it's great to be able to demonstrate the alignment between our policy and what our members' concerns are. Lastly, working with LPPI. So I've already spoken about how we worked with LPPI in developing um, the policy itself. A lot of the data and analysis that was carried out to identify what the key issues are that we're most heavily exposed to actually came from colleagues at LPPI, and I'm very grateful to the support that we got from them for that. So we work with LPPI because, as, uh, as you know, they invest on our behalf in line with our policies and including in line with our RI policy. They provide us with insight and input into our policy-making process as our investment advisor. They also provide regular reporting to us, um, both um, at committee level and also um, at officer level, um, to every quarterly investment committee meeting, and also um, in terms of our net zero commitments and progress towards those. We collaborate with them too um, through fortnightly check-ins. We collaborate on responding to regulatory consultations in the market. And we work alongside each other in uh, collaborative, what we call collaborative engagement initiatives. So where we are working together with them in talking to companies in our portfolio to encourage those companies to improve their planning around transitioning to a low carbon economy and their transparency around that. And we've also worked with them on cross-party project teams for specific RI projects, particularly, again, in the climate space. So, as key takeaways... ..for you to know today, we have a new RI policy. It will be going out um, to be published early in uh, the next year. Your views as members have fed into that process and that policy widens the scope of the RI priorities that uh, we are now pushing forward and working on to include nature, social and governance issues. And we're working collaboratively with LPPI, our managers and investors further afield to further promote and pursue that work. So thank you very much for your attention and for laughing in the right places and in the one wrong place as well. Thank you very much, Paul. Um, it's, uh, Paul's joined us, he said, this year, and he's making a huge difference to everything we're doing on responsible investment. Moving on to a panel session, um, we had... A number of questions which were sent through before today. I'll try and pick up as many of those as I can. Uh, and we've uh, had a number of questions being fed through uh, on the live feed. I've been monitoring those. I haven't just been checking my emails. Uh, if you've been looking at my iPad, I've been going through the questions that have been coming through. Um, rather than necessarily deal with 
all the individual questions, there's a number of themes that are coming through, which I'll try and address by sort of wrapping some questions up together. Uh, I would um, reiterate a point I made uh, at the very beginning of the session, though. A number of the questions that have come through are ones that relate to people's individual circumstances, be it, you know, how they can find out about a pension with another potential pension supplier, potential sources of ABC investment, uh, and so forth. Those sorts of issues, I'm afraid, we're not going to be able to deal with today here, but we will have, we, w we are able to deal with them um, at the help desk for LPPA outside. So please do uh, go to the LPPA desk, it's under the pension point banner uh, in the foyer, and they will be able to help you. If not today, they will at least be able to take your details and get back to you um, over the course of the next few days. But let me just start with a sort of general theme question for Richard. Um, obviously, a huge amount of political uncertainty. Um, we've, got the, just, uh, we've got the military crisis in the Middle East, uh, in Ukraine and various other places, persistently high inflation. Just interested, Richard, in how you feel our portfolio is structured and designed to try and address some of those ongoing challenges. Uh, I think to build on the comments that I made earlier, the, it, it, when you read headlines, even when you've sat in my position, and I've been doing this for quite a long time, you, it makes your eyebrow pop up and you think, wow, what's the impact of that? Could that have a negative impact on the portfolio and, and certainly from your position on my pension and th those other things and, and, and how that comes together? But I'd say that the, what we're seeing is, I think the world is a little bit more unstable potentially now than it has been in recent times. But for you know, looking around the room, I think the, the lifetimes of the people sat in front of me, I think many of you have lived through, possibly looking a bit back a bit further, some more, um, let's say, less stable times than we've seen in the last 15, 20 years. So I don't think it might well be that this isn't what we're seeing today isn't particularly surprising to many of you. And I think from an investment point of view, I don't think it's particularly surprising to us. Whilst many things are happening around the world and you know, parking some of the more tragic, tragic events, if I just simply focus on the investment context, these aren't things that are... Um, we, we, we feel the portfolio is well structured to cope with these things. These are things that we have built the portfolio to withstand. And even if we get into the specifics of today's events, uh, I think the portfolio is, you know, for example, there, you know, there, is, there is obviously some very, um, very challenging and tragic events unfolding in the Middle East. But the direct exposure of the portfolio to those events is limited. Um, clearly, there could be spillover type impact through such as the price of oil, whether that feeds through to inflation and other factors. But for the moment, we feel um, you know, direct risk to the portfolio is, is limited. And even if it were to, some of these events were to escalate through the transmission mechanisms of oil or inflation or interest rates, I, still maintain, I would still believe the portfolio is sufficiently global, diversified, and thoughtfully put together to withstand um, these impacts. And certainly from your perspective in terms of will you get your pensions paid on a systematic basis, I think the risks to that are extremely low um, by virtue of the, the structures and the policies that the LPFA have put in place, that we've put in place and the governance and control and operational processes around that. Thank you, Richard. Um, perhaps, Joe, I can turn to you uh, next. Um, you, you talked a great deal about the improvements that have been made over the last year and the progress you've made in trying to drive this speed. There are still obviously some concerns and questions that people have raised about the services they've, they've received. I just wonder if you want to say a little bit more about the, uh, the way in which progress has been made and the way in which you were hoping that um, people will see significant enhancements in their service over the course of the next 12 months or so. Sure, thanks, Chair. Um, yeah, I would guess they sit in sort of three buckets, really. So systems, processes, and people. Uh, and we're looking at all three of those. So when you implement a, a new system like this on this scale, you would typically expect it to take two plus years, given its size and complexity, to really kind of bed in. And we're working through that. And we've got these short-term fixes in terms of if there's anything that's not working, you can't progress a case for a certain reason. So it's from kind of bug fixing, that kind of thing, housekeeping. And then we've got this more strategic piece of work on the systems where we are improving the things that we automate. And that will free up our administrators to do more value-add stuff rather than the grunt work. In terms of processes, I mentioned in particular the retirements process around us almost deconstructing that process and looking at end-to-end -end of where are the pain points and how do we improve them and taking feedback from lots of areas. So 
what kinds of complaints do we get? How, what's the feedback that we're getting from members in terms of the surveys and things like that, and feeding that into that process improvement cycle. And finally, people. You know, so we're seeing that kind of, we're seeing the retention stabilise. We're able to recruit people with good experience and we are training the people that we've got heavily, not just in terms of their technical ability, but also in terms of their customer service skills and abilities. One of the things you will notice is that when the questions are easy, I will answer them. <laughs> um, when the questions aren't, uh, I will hand them off. Um, so one question I just want to address. Um, one of the questions referred to uh, what some of you will have read about, referred to as the liability-driven investment crisis um, that arose during the comparatively short premiership of this trust. Uh, I can deal with that one easily by saying that we weren't invested in any liability-driven investment, so it had no effect on us. Oh, well, I'm very glad to say, obviously, rises in interest rates had a very significant impact on us, but we are very relatively well managed, as Richard has said, to deal with those issues. Um, Richard, um, Robert, perhaps I can ask you, um, uh, we were 128% funded uh, at our last triennial valuation at 31st of March 2022. Um, in our annual statement at the 31st of March 2023, we were 118% funded. The question was, just how does that compare with other pension funds? Is it good? Is it bad? Are we in a good position comparatively? Great question. Um, thank you for that, because that's about the financial health of the fund, which obviously is of interest to me. Uh, the short version is I can't tell you definitively where 118 sits against other funds this year, because unlike the valuation in 2022, we don't publish or government doesn't publish everyone's results. So I can talk about 22, where if you think there are, say, 80 uh, LGPS funds in England and Wales, there were probably about a dozen who hadn't got to 100%. There were probably a dozen, including us, who were around 120 to 100, 125 to 135. And then the bulk of people were 100 to 110, 115% funded. So we were at the very top sort of quota of funds in terms of funding rate at 2022. So I fully expect us to be in a similar position, albeit the number is 118% um, more recently. Actually, I would just add, if you compare that with private sector pension funds as opposed to local government schemes, then we are, I can confidently say, very much better funded than the vast majority of those. Um, Joe, uh, a question about um, the way in which um, local government pension schemes, LPFA pension schemes, um, uh, payments have increased over the last few years by comparison to changes in state pension. You mentioned this briefly uh, in your uh, session, but I thought you might perhaps just expand on that and say a little bit more about how um, uh, inflation rises for our, our members are determined. So, so increases to your LGPS pension is set within the rules of the, of the LGPS fund. Um, so that is essentially is an inflation increase and, and it applies every April from the previous September. So this year 10.1, next year 6.7. Your state pension has something called the triple lock. For anybody that doesn't know what that is, it's essentially a best of three. So it's either the best of in, an inflation increase, an earnings slash wages increase, or 2.5%. So what's going to happen next April is your local government pension scheme will increase by 6.7%. Under the triple lock, the earnings kicks in in April 24, so that's going to be 8.5%. So you can see there that your triple lock is going to give you a higher increase on your basic state pension than you're going to get on your local government pension scheme. That, that's basically the difference. Thank you. Um, there was a question about uh, investment in infrastructure. Uh, many of you will have seen that the government have been promoting what they're referring to as the mansion house reforms, which are um, trying to encourage all pension funds, not just LGPS, but private sector schemes, uh, direct contribution schemes, defined contribution schemes and so forth, to invest more in certain types of assets, particularly in infrastructure, with a view to encouraging transition to net zero and uh, levelling up of the UK economy. Uh, very pleased to say that um, uh, wherever those um, government reforms end up, um, we are already very well 
very heavily invested in infrastructure and in uh, contributions to all net zero in the UK. Through Julio, we are one of, if not the, uh, leading investor, for example, in UK wind farms. Um, and we're very proud uh, of that investment. And it's been a very good investment for us as well, which has been terrific. Um, Richard, perhaps I can ask you um, a question about how, uh, to do with pooling, how our investment aims as LPFA um, uh, work in conjunction with the investment aims of the other investors in our pool. It's a great question and one that we've pondered and discussed and refined over, oh, over a number of years. The, what I'd say is they're very complementary. So from a financial objectives point of view, the LGPS has, in, in aggregate, similar benefits, similar aims. So whilst funds might look slightly different in the way that they talk about what they do, fundamentally, the aims of the scheme are very similar in the long term. is to take in contributions, invest those sustainably, grow that capital base, pay pensions as they fall due both now and in the future. That is the aim of all of the LGPS funds. And that... that that's, um, similarity of objectives from a financial point of view makes it very helpful. Risk appetites are roughly similar as well. For funds because to deliver those gains, it's similar because the contributions are set centrally, so that helps. I think the point where potentially there could be more debate or discussion is around the RI, the ESG objectives. You know, the LPFA are very, um, have, what's the word, correct term, ambitious um, about the LPFA. It's a very core part to who and what you are, or what the LPFA stands for, and take, and take it very seriously. I'd say it's not in conflict at all with our other clients, uh, but the LPFA are a leading light in that in that zone, or with, in terms of RI and ESG, and our other clients uh, are in the same zone, but not so um, uh, innovative, let's say. Uh, but it, they are absolutely not in conflict. We are able to run the portfolios efficiently. Um, and, and meet the requirements of all our clients without any, I don't see any negatives or drawbacks through pooling from that perspective. Thank you. Paul, perhaps I can just briefly ask you, you talked about um, the pillars uh, and our aims and so forth. Obviously, we're making choices in all of those things. Um, I just wonder if you'd like to say a few words about how, although we focus on certain key areas, that doesn't mean to say we're ignoring all the others. No, that's right. Um, I mean, uh, in the process of identifying the key issues that I highlighted, a number of others did come up. And as I also said, a lot of these issues are very interconnected. So many of the key issues that didn't quite make the cut are actually implicitly present in those key issues that we are working on. Um, and um, really, as, as I referenced in, in my slide deck, um, those issues that we are working on, we know first and foremost, are those that we are most uh, heavily exposed to right now. So from an investment perspective, they are very relevant to us. Um, but there are lots of others under the surface that we also are aware of that um, can come up in um, our interactions with um, our managers. Um, and they can and do come up as through that interaction that we have with them. And, and just one final question uh, about um, people have asked whether there are any likely changes um, in the relevant legislation that affects the LGPS uh, and therefore your pension. Um, we're not aware, obviously, I mean, obviously governments um, uh, can change their minds, governments can change. Um, we're not aware of any um, proposed significant changes in the LGPS itself. There is a government consultation about um, pooling uh, and the way in which pooling works. Um, the government is very supportive of pooling and is encouraging the LGPS as a whole throughout the UK um, to collaborate more within pools. I'm very pleased to say that we are um, at the forefront of, of pooling. Uh, we were the first people to go into a pool, we're completely pooled, and therefore everything we've got is already consistent with where the government are suggesting they would like us to get to. Uh, and that is actually a cross-party approach, as far as we can tell. So I think we're very comfortable that we are well positioned to address any potential changes that do come through. But obviously, governments can do whatever governments would like to do. Very conscious that I'm afraid we've run out of time. But thank you, everybody, for all the questions. Uh, I hope we've dealt with most of the themes, even if we haven't dealt with all of the individual questions. 
um, I would just once again say uh, for those people who submitted questions about their personal circumstances or about choices they would like to make, please do go and consult colleagues at the LPPA desk or uh, email uh, LPPA uh, at your questions thereafter and we will try and make sure that they are addressed. Can I in conclusion just thank you all once again, both the people in the room and those people um, who have attended online. We are incredibly grateful that you are showing this level of interest in our fund. Uh, we hope that we are providing you with the service uh, that you need and particularly to make sure that we continue to pay the pensions that you deserve. Um, and I hope to see you all again this time next year. Have a safe journey home.